universities are a different space. You know, I mean, they have a deep and a profound relationship to the larger um, discourse of a democratic society. But there's an opportunity within universities to do something that, especially in this current climate and this era we're living in, is all but impossible to do in the broader public sphere, which is really asking what are what are the necessary conditions for people to fully inhabit their intellectual freedom? What are the necessary conditions for robust argument that doesn't devolve into people want to tear, tearing each other's heads off? Welcome to Heterodox Out Loud. I'm John Tomasi, the president of Heterodox Academy. On every episode, we'll be taking you on an exciting intellectual journey, an adventure across the complex and challenging terrain of open inquiry in higher education. You'll be meeting some leading college professors, some heterodox college presidents, and some entrepreneurial students too. Our aim is to give you an insider's view of the complex terrain of open inquiry in higher education, the perils and the possibilities too. So let's get ready for another adventure into heterodoxy. Should universities adopt a policy of institutional neutrality? Heterodox Academy is pairing with the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression and the Academic Freedom Alliance to encourage them to do just that. HXA has also developed our own model of institutional neutrality. You can re read about it on our website, look for our report, Extraordinary You, the HXA model of principled neutrality. Today on Heterodox Out Loud, we're going to be talking about the classic formulation of institutional neutrality, the Calvin Committee report from the University of Chicago in 1967. Our very special guest is Jamie Calvin, son of Harry Calvin, who wrote the report. Jamie will bring some surprising insights to us as we think about what the committee was thinking, what other issues were at play at the, in those days, and how they might help us think in fresh ways about the idea of institu institutional neutrality today. Let's hear what Jamie has to say. Jamie Calvin, welcome to the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's nice to have you here. Um, I emailed you out of the blue after reading some of your work uh, on the Calvin Report on some other related issues. When I emailed you out of the blue, I hear you Googled around about me and discovered we have some unusual, unexpected connections. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, to my <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, who's this guy who emailed me? So I <laughs> did a Google search and found in one of the biographical, you know, capsule biographies of you that you grew up in Underhill Center, Vermont. That's right. And I have a deep connection to Underhill Center. <laughs> we have you know, convey to people what a tiny dot on the map this is. It is. You know the population. I don't know it offhand, but, you know, a small little Vermont hamlet on the side of Mount Mansfield. And right. my wife is from the same small town. And for the last 40 odd years, we've spent summers there and Christmas and uh, really raised our kids both on the south side of Chicago and in Underhill Center. Nice. On the south side of Mount Mansfield. And on the south side. <laughs> <laughs> and I grew up on Pleasant Valley Road and you were and you were you were your family or your wife's family was up on Mountain Road, which just, just around the corner from us. So so you drove by my house many times. Countless times. And I, I run a loop. I run a loop when I'm there that takes me down Pleasant Valley Road. Yeah, I know so that I run, I, run, I run that loop too. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I'll just add one more thing, if 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 I may, that yeah. as I under, as, as as best we can understand. Um, well, my, so my grandparents moved to that tiny town um, when my grandparents were young in 1942, and they bought an old farmhouse. The barn had burned. The, the barn had burned down, so it wasn't very valuable. Um, and they bought a farmhouse with, I think, 300 acres. And as I understand, my wife, I'm sorry, my mother, babysat your wife. She did, and, <laughs> and, and your siblings. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> So that's, our, so that's that's so that's our background. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to talk with you about uh, about your experience with your father, and I know that 
I mentioned that the Calvin report, this um, extremely important report, this gem, a two-page uh, masterwork. And I, I tell some of my friends that the Calvin report has this strange feature in the academic world, kind of a great rarity of being um, simultaneously beautifully written, uh, extremely important, and brief. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's unusual in the academic world. Find some of that. I should say, I should say of my father that he was a very good writer. He was not yes. known for brevity, so this was uh, an unusual. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and to listeners who have not read the Calvin Report, we, we just, I just highly recommend that you Google it and check it out. It's it's really a it's a masterwork. It'll be thirty minutes, the best spent thirty minutes of your day if you um, read the. Maybe you could probably read it and read it in fifteen. Your father, um, that report came out in 1967. Your pa- father passed away um, quite suddenly uh, in, in 1979, I believe. 74. Oh, I'm sorry, 74. And he was, I think, 60 years old or barely 60. Right. Um, he died at his desk, as I understand, with a heart attack. He died at his desk. He actually had had health problems starting at 55. He had a, had a heart attack. A couple of years later, a stroke and then died at 60. And the last five years of his life, he devoted um, to a sustained effort to write a book that he conceived of at the beginning of his career and had talked about for years. And he was a very prolific writer, but writing kind of in response to events and law review articles and general magazines. And he had... um, in 1964, given lectures at Ohio State University, uh, the the title of which was "The Negro and the First Amendment: Use of right. the Word Negro," obviously of that time, yes, um, which was a really kind of fascinating. To this day, it's an interesting um, book to to read, examining the contribution of the civil rights movement to First Amendment law, um, and so he, he had been actively, actively engaged with First Amendment issues throughout his career. And as his health failed, he finally put other engagements aside to write the book he'd always wanted to write, which he conceived of as a sort of intellectual history of the First Amendment at the level of the Supreme Court, written um, obviously for lawyers, but also with some thought to a general audience. Um, and he was in the midst of that book when he when he died. He was actually, as you say, at his desk. And um, you know, I was early in my career as a as a writer, was very close to my father. Um, you know, had read the the manuscript up to that point. Uh, while he was alive, we talked about it, and ultimately, together with some of his colleagues, it was decided that um the best approach with this extraordinary manuscript, and I should describe it a little bit, you know, it was, I think, 1,200 pages, and it was literally a first draft. So if I, if I gave you, John, if I gave you a first draft and said, would you look at, you know, it would be a fifth or sixth draft. And when I described it as a first draft, I would be saying, it's still open to change. You know, I'm still working on it. Right. In my dad's case, it was literally a first draft. And what he would do is he was a very fluent writer. He would write, you know, he would immerse himself in in a particular body of First Amendment law. He would write. And then each summer, he was an academic, so each summer when he was on vacation, he would take his manuscript with him, read through it, and write marginalia, you know, write a set of marginal comments to himself. And the marginalia you know, extended from like an exclamation part, an exclamation mark next to something to full pages on the backside of a manuscript critiquing his own own work. Nice. You know, after he died, there's this this kind of masterwork, but in a very vulnerable condition, not completed with gaps, first draft. And um, somewhat quixotically, uh, I undertook, you know, with the support of various... uh, colleagues of my dad's who who helped and were kind of editorial sounding boards, I undertook to finish it. And, you know, more than a decade later, it was published uh, under the title of Worthy Tradition, Freedom of Speech in America. And I, I should mention just for uh, listeners who don't who don't know, 
that Harry Calvin was one of the most important First Amendment jurisprudence of the last century and was you know, party to a lot of these um, extremely important breakthroughs that are being made in that century about what is, this, what is the scope of this thing, the First Amendment? How wide is it? How narrow is it? What is it? What, where, where are the exceptions? What is, how do you fill it out? So it was, um, it, it's just, it, it was remarkable. And, and, and as I remember, you were, you were, um, you were in your twenties, I think, or late twenties. Yeah, I was in my, I was in my mid twenties when I started wow. and, you know, had published a little bit and was really, uh, sort of rehearsing a career as a journalist rather than, than fully established. And this became my you know, apprenticeship. I mean, you know, completely foundational experience for me. I was very, very close to my father. and. Um, I think my sensibility, sense of language sort of formed in conversation with him from childhood, from childhood on. But the uncanny thing about this project was that the conversation, I mean, I don't want to minimize the grief and the sense of loss and the disruption, but the, uh, the conversation intensified after his death through the medium of this, uh, very taxing and, you know, utterly consuming project. Um, I, I want to talk to you about, about the Calvin report. Yeah. Um, we can talk about the report itself. Maybe I'll do that first just a little bit, and then we can talk about whether you found anything in the, in the notes as you were working through them. So the Calvin report, as, as you know, is this brief statement that takes out a, a, a position on the question of what role universities should have in social and political action. And most of the most of the um, the weight of the report is to is to establish a heavy presumption against university presidents, for example, speaking out on controversial political issues on behalf of the university. And among the you know beautiful famous lines from that from that um, from that report that your father was the chair chairperson of is this line that the university is the home and sponsor of critics. It is not itself the critic. And that the university on this ideal is a truth-seeking organization directed at that mission of learning and teaching, but that the appropriate unit of the criticism or critic for the university is going to be the individual professors and, and I'll add students as well. Is that how is that a rough is that a, a reasonable explanation or a summary of the report? I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair statement of the report. Um and presumption is the key word because there's also allowance for exceptions to this general principle, but the exceptions aren't spelled out. You know, right. um, so I can't remember the exact language. You may have it in front of you, yeah. but um, you know, maybe worth quoting that. That I'll I'll I'll, re I'll read it if I may. I'll I'll read actually. Well, I'll I'll read two things. Um, just at the very beginning of the report. So I should add that the, the Calvin report is being discussed so much now, and um, there has kind of grown up, grown up around it. What I think of as almost a Calvin absolutism. Hmm. Universities who sign on to this report or this ideal of neutrality, as expressed in the report, and there could be other there could be other explications of institution of neutrality that are different than this report. Yeah. Calvin's principle is basically the idea that the university achieves neutrality by not speaking at all. Rival conceptions of neutrality might say the university can speak, but should do it in an even-handed way. That could also be a way to find neutrality. But this report emphasizes, uh, the main weight of the report emphasizes the idea that universities should just should not speak on these controversial topics so as to not crowd out the voices of dissenting professors and students who have, have different views. And a couple of lines I'll just read from the very beginning of the report. It says that um, the committee conceives its function principally of providing, quote, a point of departure for discussion in the university. And at the very end, and it's framed at the very end of the report, we hear this, this, you know, this, this line that, um, that they've established a, a, quote, heavy presumption against the university taking collective action or making these kind of statements. So it's, the report's framed with these, these very nuanced, uh, short, powerful notices that this is an invitation to a conversation, the beginnings of a conversation, and now more substantively, the 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 the, the famous clause in the middle. I call I call it the Calvin clause. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll read it aloud if I may. 
So they've, they've established this ideal of the university as this, this place for this very special institution for raucous conversations. <laughs> that um, it's, not, it's not an act of cowardice for the university not to take stands. Rather, it's an act of bravery because it's saying the university, by being quiet, is, a, is making maximal space for the professors and students to, to speak their mind and their various, their various minds that they might have. Yeah. And then we come across this Calvin Clause, as I call it. I'll, I'll read it out loud. From time to time, instances will arise in which the society or segments of it threaten the very mission of the university and its values of free inquiry. In such a crisis, it becomes the obligation of the university as an institution to oppose such measures and to actively defend its interests and its values. So the clause and I was saying is that have your presumption about not speaking, but the clause says there may be times when the very mission of the university and its commitment to free inquiry and its interests and its values need to be defended. Um, what do you make of that of that clause? I think that's I, I think that's key. So a couple of observations. One is, you know, every word in the report was written by my father. You know, it's his voice, it's his diction, it's his use of language. But the report came out of a committee process. Um, in which there were multiple tensions between committee members, you know, quite distinct, quite distinct viewpoints. One can imagine. Some of which track some of the current controversy about uh, institutional neutrality. And so my dad was in the position of, it's something that he actually very much appreciated in, in sort of judicial craftsmanship. So, um, you know, we all can be stirred by a flaming dissent from, from a judge or, you know, a Supreme Court justice, which is the equivalent of writing a polemical essay, you know, you, in your own voice. Yeah. But there, there is another form of um, what my dad called judicial statementship, statesmanship, nice. I love where, that. where, you know, a judge is trying to build a majority in support of an important principle and has to accommodate contending views within the judges who will constitute that majority. Right. And sometimes that produces internal contradiction and squishy language and you know bad writing in judicial right. decisions. I think this is an example where those tensions within this collegial group making a joint statement sort of forced the both a level of abstraction, you know, it sort of forced them to a level of abstraction and to the the um, kind of elegant formulations that you've that you've noted. So um, the idea that this is a presumption. It's not an absolute, it's not an absolutist stance. It's a strong presumption. There are exceptions that can be entertained to that, to that presumption. And, you know, in the law, um, principles are defined by their, um, the, the limits on their application. I mean, it's, it's, you define the parameters of a principle, um, by where you don't apply it as well as where you apply it. So, you know, the, so, and, and I think that notion that it's a point of departure, inviting a conversation. And I think what my dad quite, ex and I think I, when I went back into his files with respect to the Calvin report, I found some language to this effect. I, there's a communication to other members of the committee saying, in effect, we, you know, we only have an opportunity to s say something once. And we have a choice between strongly stating the strongly stating the principle, and again, I can't remember the exact language, but the idea was or trying to anticipate all the different forms that exceptions to the principle might take, like a lawyer writing a contract or something. I, I have I have I have that language. May I, may I read it? Yeah, please. And, and it's a, it, it, I found it in this uh, just really fascinating um, piece that you wrote in two thousand six which I also want to highly recommend um, to our listeners. It's called Unfinished Business of the Calvin Report. 
Again, it's called The Unfinished Business of the Cotton Report by Jamie Calvin, November 28th, 2006. And I'm interested in I'm interested in, in how you came to write this piece, and I'll ask you about that in a moment. But I'll just but just the the passage you were just referring to, you you quote him uh, something a memo he wrote to the committee, and I'll just read it out loud. And it's track it's tracking exactly what what you just described. He's, your father wrote quote he wrote to the committee quote, it seems to me, particularly after struggling with the drafting, that we have a we have a tricky choice of where to spend our emphasis elegant phrase, or spend our emphasis. I think we can only spend it once effectively. And the question is whether we spend it in stating the general principle against collective action or spend it in sketching the exceptional case in which collective action may be appropriate. Close quote. And you go on to say that he opted and suggested to the committee that they spend it once. Right. And that, that, was, the, <laughs> that was the resolution. But I think it also is tied to something that you highlighted in your initial framing, which is this notion that the the statement of the Calvin Committee is a point of departure. It's not engraved in stone. It's not a tablet handed down. You know, it it is a point of departure for what I think he foresaw. And I, I think his First Amendment, his writing about First Amendment jurisprudence is relevant here. I think he foresaw a kind of common law process unfolding from this point of departure, the statement of a principle, that there would be an ongoing dialogue, that events would present new questions, that successive generations would grapple with those questions, and um, and that there would be a body of reflection and experience that built over time. And if I have a criticism of the, and I have several, but of the the way in which the Calvin Report has been deployed at the University of Chicago, and I imagine elsewhere, is too often it's been used as a kind of shield against having that conversation. It's sort of been used to shut down the conversation rather than an availability to really, to really engage. And, um, and I think that's a fair reading in the context of my father's work generally of where that language was, you know, um, uh, pointing and the, 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 there's a relevant, I, I described before the marginalia in his first amendment manuscript. There's a, a wonderful passage, you know, all of this is sort of handwritten and his type handwriting. And I think it's on the back side of a manuscript page. And he was a great admirer of Hugo Black, Justice Hugo Black, who, who uh, particularly at times in the post-war period and the anti-communist era, when other justices were kind of losing their bearings and with the anti-communist anxieties, Hugo Black was just a, a kind of North Star of clarity. But Black um, had a kind of absolute reading of the First Amendment, right? Congress shall make no law means Congress shall make no law, period. Yes. And so what my dad's note says, you know, acknowledging um, Black's sort of gallantry and all there is to admire in his performance as a justice, he, you know, there's a passage kind of critiquing Black in that vein. And at the end, he writes, as for my own view, I think of the First Amendment as being almost an absolute. Right. And almost, and the almost means you have to win the argument by sweat every time. I think that was the way he put it. And I think that's the critical thing that has often been missing from the way in which the Calvin Report has been, been or at least been perceived as using, you know, students and others perceive administrations as using it. Um, that almost is critical because that means you're open and available to to grapple with whatever the particular issue being presented is. It isn't dispositive of the question. The presumption right. the presumption remains. But I think there's been something kind of miseducating about the way in which the report has often been used just to slam the door on discourse rather than you know rather than demonstrably allowing for it. 
I'm going to ask you, I'd like to ask you more about that. So that's, that's my reading of Calvin as well. And it's also my reading of some of the way it's being deployed, you might say. The report does say, as I mentioned, that this position that they're advocating is not happening, it's not out of cowardice or lack of commitment. It's rather a, a daring endeavor to allow this freedom of speech to happen. And yet there are, all, it, there are these questions that almost absolute is where so much of the action was in the last century that your father was very involved in. You know, what does it mean? Free speech, but does that mean you can have fraudulent claims on commercial products? Well, that's yeah. speech. Yeah. Does it mean you can incite violence uh, you know, in an immediate case? Well, that's speech. And so there's a lot of work that was done to figure out what does this mean? And by, by carving out the exceptions, if we're going to call them that, one has to reflect and understand more deeply the meaning and value of the core principle. And you, and you say something in this, uh, this beautiful essay of yours, The Unfinished Business of the Calvin Report, that I'm going to quote, and this is you now, not your father. You talk about that almost. Yeah. And you say that um, the tradition of freedom of speech takes the form, form of, takes the form of, about, takes the form of arguing about the content of that tradition. And now you say, and a key measure of our stewardship of First Amendment values is the quality of that argument. On this view, a principle is not diminished, but clarified and deepened by the process of mapping its boundaries. Yeah. Which uh, I think it's a really beautiful and I think accurate um, description of the exciting path of First Amendment jurisprudence, especially over the past, say, 60, 70 years. And I wonder about the Calvin report. I wonder about it. I mentioned this to you in an email. I wonder if there's an analogy that with First Amendment law, due to the work of your father and, and many others of his generation, and it's, and it's ongoing, of course. Yeah. Um, we developed, we're developing an ever more sophisticated understanding of what the First Amendment is by carving out some of those exceptions. I wonder, I'm just sort of playing with this idea. I kind of feel that with native institutional neutrality in the university setting. We're similarly in its in its in, in our infancy, yeah. in our understanding of what those what those interesting exceptions sketched out in the report. What, is it, is it big enough to drive a truck through? You know, what, what kind of truck? What when when trucks? And I, what do you, what do you think of that? Is it? Do you think? Yeah, I think report? I think I think what's been missing, at least, you know, I, I should be clear. I'm not an academic. You know, I'm I'm a writer. I'm I'm out under the broad umbrella of the First Amendment. I'm engaged in First Amendment controversies of various sorts. That's my, that's my work. So I have an almost ethnographic relationship to academia. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm here a, a few blocks away from the University of Chicago campus. I work, you know, collaborate with academics, but I'm really um, coming at these things from another perspective and, and you know, as a journalist. And my observation is, you know, compared to the rigor and richness of First Amendment jurisprudence at its best, that um, the principle of institutional neutrality has not been subjected to that kind of, of process. And, and maybe now there's an opportunity for that because, you know, it's been such a mess post-October 7th. Yes. For so many institutions, this yes. feels like there might be space when the dust settles for a kind of a, a reset and a kind of reconsideration of some of these questions. And I don't think the answer is just to push forward the Calvin principle, you know, right. absent other kinds of interventions. And, you know, because I, I think part of what may have been alienating for some students about the way the Calvin Report has been used by various institutions is it's not sufficient in itself. You know, it states a principle, but if institutions are really going to make good on a principle of a commitment to robust debate and really a commitment to dissent, you know, a commitment to creating the conditions for for vigorous dissent, for vigorous disagreement, I think that requires more of the institution than just articulation of the principle. And so I'm wondering if we're now maybe, you know, as so many university presidents and administrations are kind of reeling from 
these last weeks, um, if there's now not an opening for a richer set of conversations within individual institutions and more broadly about about precisely these questions, the other thing, John, that I would I would emphasize is you know as I said I I sort of swim in these broader First Amendment waters. That's what I do, you know, and um, I'm an investigative journalist. I, you know, I get subpoenaed for my notes I, in court. I know. <laughs> I, I, mean, I want to ask I, you about that too. <laughs> city is trying to hold me in. I mean, you know, so that that that's <laughs> one zone. You know, that's one zone of the First Amendment, and you know, and I expect to be attacked, and I, you know, you, you, it's just, you know, it's a rugby scrum. The the I think part of what sometimes gets conflated in a problematic way is universities are a different space. You know, I mean, they have a deep and a profound relationship to the larger um, discourse of a democratic society, but there's an opportunity within universities to do something that, especially in this current climate and this era we're living in, is all but impossible to do in the broader public sphere, which is really asking what are what are the necessary conditions for people to fully inhabit their intellectual freedom? What are the necessary conditions for robust argument that doesn't devolve into people want to tear, tearing each other's heads off? Right. And, and there's always been that. I think the person I most associate um, among thinkers with that sort of distinction is Alexander Mickeljohn. I don't know if you're aware of Mickeljohn's work. Very well, very well. Yeah. Yes. Mickeljohn was the president of Amherst and I think provost at Brown. And, and, you know, right. But he, in the post-war period, became passionately and really bravely, courageously engaged with First Amendment issues. Yes. But for Mickeljohn, the question was always, what are the requirements of self-governing, of being self-governing citizens? And so the you know the broad principles were key to that, but also education was key to it. So you know, and I think if we could get back to that sort of basic set of questions, and thinking as a journalist, and I promoted this idea with some folks at the University of Chicago, um, what would we learn if we did a really rigorous institutional audit? Asking people, you know, in a well-designed kind of inquiry about their lived experience within the university in terms of their freedom to think, to dissent, to, um, you know, I, I think, you know, the, there's a danger of with First Amendment discourse and certainly with the, the Calvin, you know, the discourse around the Calvin report to live wholly in a, in a, a sort of abstract conceptual realm in how we debate and inquire and engage. And I think, especially post October 7th, the possibility of really doing a, a rich kind of diagnostic inquiry, you know, how's it working for you? How's it working? I should, I, should, I should mention at this point that, um, that Heterodox Academy we work on the cultural piece. We're interested. We, so we work closely with organizations like FIRE, which is an essentially legal organization that defends the, the rights of individuals or speech rights, the rights to due process on campuses and, and beyond now. HXA partners with them, not so much on the legal side, but rather we ask, well, once you have free speech protections at a university, what's the quality of conversation? Right. Oh. How brave are they? And we, we run a big survey every year on a large national survey called the, called the Campus Expression Survey, the CES, which examines these things. We find, you know, this in the most recent report this year, one of our one of our findings we've been a trend line we've been we've been watching is that students often report that they self censor, not because of their concern about the ideology ideology of their professor. They self censor because they're concerned about their fellow students. Peer group, yeah. <laughs> in particular, what they're going to say on social media. They, they float an idea in class to, just to try it out, and they worry about being being quoted. I want to go. Oh, I'm sorry, I think that I, I do think that 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 line of inquiry, especially now, would really elevate the 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 discourse about the Calvin report and that constellation of questions. 
Um, you know, and I've done some report, I did some reporting years ago where um, that involved some issues around the University of Chicago closing down access to the emergency room. You know, an urban university situated on a largely black south side. And um, there were ER doctors who were more frightened to speak to me as sources than um, whistleblowing cops I've reported on and, um, you know, wrongfully convicted um, individuals caught up in the criminal, you know. And I, I think we we can't look past that, um, you know, both the the peer culture that people fear, and not just students. I think faculty increasingly, um, you know, and the more institutional dynamic. If your department head has taken a strong position on this, that, or the other, and your, you know, junior faculty, right, does that inhibit you? That's right, and there's also a lot, a lot of attention now that we're, we're we're now really working on think to think about what are the uh, academic freedom rights of students? Can students yeah. speak out if they do? Are they vulnerable for being doxxed? How does how does how, what's that realm of protections there? I want to ask you just up again, stay on the Calvin report just for a little bit more. Um, you know, when the attacks happened on, on October seventh, uh, one of the striking one of the things we observed that was most striking was that there was a lack of statements made by college presidents in the immediate aftermath. The Chronicle of Higher Education wrote a piece on October 10th, and their informal uh, survey, they can only identify 14 university presidents that have made statements on the topic. And the context in which university presidents have been making statements on every That's imaginable right. <laughs> at, at an ever-increasing rate um, you know, in his recent years. And that, and that was taken to be a kind of speech by itself. And you know, some people that started thinking about some of these university presidents, well, maybe they should take a principled position to not. Take. Now, the timing is and the transition is a difficult question. What's the right moment to make that decision? I'm not sure that was the right time to to do that because it looked like it was uh, the Calvin report of convenience. Yeah, but there was, it was Calvin, <laughs> Calvinizing for convenience. But but there was there was a sense, I think, on, on I know on, on some university campuses and some administrations that, you know, the Calvin could be like, the Calvin is cavalry. It'll come over the hill and say, oh, good, here's our way out of this. We don't need to speak anymore. And I think there's something important about that. And, I, and I'm grateful that universities are now actually thinking seriously about, about, these, about this report and about the principles within it. But I want to ask you a little bit more about um, what those exceptions might be. And I was going to give you, a, I'll just share, I'll, I'll share some with you that you may, you may find interesting. I, was, I did a podcast, HXA sponsored a well, we sp- I was, I've been involved in two podcasts in the last week. One was co-sponsored between HXA and FIRE to talk about um, the Calvin Report and the idea of institutional neutrality. And then HXA sponsored one just last week with um, that I hosted. It was with Nadine Strawson, a former head of the ACLU, and, and Keith Whittington, a really distinguished professor at Princeton. Keith and I actually have a, I've been working on an ed- edited volume on the Calvin Report. And you may enjoy you may enjoy this because when Keith and I decided to put together this volume of critical essays on the Calvin Report, um, we decided this uh, last winter. I think we actually had, to kind of, had kind of a hard time getting people to agree to um, to, to, to write our chapters for us, and we also shopped the we also shopped our uh, book idea to a variety of presses, including one press that's very close to you. Okay. And, <laughs> And at the time, I can actually get see their offices. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not naming names. I'm just saying we we we, we found a press. We're, we're very happy with it. But it was kind of interesting to find. Wow, this this is not a hot topic. But now, of course, it's on everyone's mind. But in just going back to that clause that I meant, the Calvin clause, the bit that says there may be uh, there may be a, a, instances will arise under times of crisis when it has an obligation to speak to defend its interests and its values. On that on that call I had just recently with um, Nadine Strawson and with Keith Whittington, I asked them a couple of te- test cases. So they both endorsed the Calvin Report in a strong version, and the and the Fire people also endorsed a very strong, what I view as a very strong reading of the the st- rigid the rigidity uh, and the, the strong strength of that neutrality principle and the, the non speak principle. And I said, well, what about for example, a recent Supreme Court case 
that says that the which decided that um, universities may not engage in affirmative action in admissions. And I asked both Nadine and and Keith, do you think the Calvin clause would kick in in that instance? Is that the kind of thing that the university president should speak out about? And they both said it's not. They both said no. Calvin would say, let that be out there for the um, for the students and professors to talk about. And the university should take no stand on that. And I pressed a bit more. I said, well, what about what about um, an administration which starts taxing endowments? Is that the kind of thing they should speak out about? Or what about a, a, an administration which puts a ban across um, people coming from, say, Muslim countries, students and faculty too? Or as you now see in the, in the House, there's a, a bill that's been talked about, a, a ban perhaps on Gazans uh, coming to the U.S. Those all seem to, be, to affect the essential functioning of the mission. I didn't ask them all about all those questions, my colleague, but my sense was that a lot of people would say, well, no, Calvin says, we don't get involved in that. What do you, what's your take on that? So I, I actually, I think that the, the latter example is, is particularly striking because here at the University of Chicago, um, one instance of the former president, uh, Bob, Bob Zimmer. Robert Zimmer, um, taking a public position was in response to restrictions on immigration that would have affected students' ability to access. I remember. The I remember. That seems to me very plausible, you know, as an exception. I mean, there you have something that is directly affecting the functioning, the you know, the core functions of the university, and and also something on which there's real competence to speak as a university president. I mean, I think the, you know, I think you said something earlier that suggested this. I think, you know, people now have spoken out on so many things and particularly in the post George Floyd era, you know, you get this kind of performative, almost branding operation um, that is completely unedifying and I think it's rendered. There's, some, there's, there's something corporate about some of the statements. It's yeah, it's cor- you know, it's like corporations giving you know millions of dollars to Black Lives Matter, but not changing any of their right. underlying practices. It, um, and I think the vulnerability of any number of university presidents in this moment, you know, to now invoke the Calvin Report as a shield, uh, it, it is just not credible when right. you pronouncing on all these other things and i'm not minimizing the the gravity and importance of those subjects it's just what what's the value added and what is the um the special authority to speak and i, I think one you know one of the things i wanted to come back to is i'm troubled i find myself troubled by the term neutrality which i think is part of how students and others who are kind of disposed to misread the the underlying values in in play it's just you know for it just seems morally intolerable to be neutral as to what's happening in the middle east right now exactly right exactly. that's right it seems to me it seems to me there can be moral dignity in being silent about it and right. especially when the silence is generative, when the silence is allowing for other voices and for other processes um, to fill the the public sphere, the academic sphere. And but I think the other advantage of silence is it lends gravity to your speech when you do speak. That's right. That's right. So I think I think Zimmer in a certain sense got it right, you know, that um that was a, you know, you could argue it both ways, but it was certainly a plausible exception to the Calvin report, right? And it it resonated because of silence on any number of other issues that the president was invited to speak on. There was another. There was another instance. Um, I don't know the details well, but I know the outline at least. I, I, again, at Chicago, while Zimmer was president of a department, I believe it was the English department. Making it in the wake of George Floyd, making the decision to, again, as I recall, to only admit graduate students for the next year or two who worked on issues of race in America. Yeah. 
Yeah. So they made a decision. And, the, and some people, some critics, oh, wait a minute, this is a violation of neutrality. They're now taking a position as a unit within the university. And Zimmer actually came down in favor of the department's ability, right, to make autonomy, to make that kind of a decision. They said, this is a decision units make. They may get it right. They may get it wrong. Yeah. But we empower them to make these decisions themselves, not endorsing their decision or criticizing, just saying that's, that's the bet they're making. But, uh, but it was, again, one of these kind of moments where Calvin didn't just answer all the questions. It required, and there's another a term you used before. I, I want to bring it, bring it, bring her back around to the Calvin uh, principle. I'm reading, I just read a really fascinating draft of an essay by Robert Post, a very distinguished law professor at Yale. It's, it's, it's a draft of an essay he's writing for the volume that Keith Whittington and I are, are working on. And one of the things he talks about is he worries a bit that the Calvin principle taken strictly, do not speak. It, it 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 obviates or it, it anticipates and makes unable makes it disables an ideal of uh, a certain idea of statesmanship. Yeah, on the part of university presidents. Now, the cynics will say we don't want statesmanship from university presidents. Thank you. We've had enough other attempts to do that in the corporate way. But I think the idea there is that there should be some space. I think in a principle to be principled to express the educational content of this ideal as an important piece of act of bravery while also allowing the space for something like presidential statesmanship yeah and sure. i would use a different I, I i like the term statesmanship but I, I would really use something a term more fundamental which is judgment so um you know one of the things i found fascinating as a non-lawyer uh, um about my immersion in constitutional law working on my dad's book was sort of the question of what makes a good judge? You know, what makes a great judge? And um, there are many ways to go at that question or answer it. But one of the things that struck me was um, that the life of the society will continuously generate new and difficult, new and difficult issues. and what you ideally want are judges who are immersed in and have absorbed and uh, um, you know the collective experience with related related issues and with all the competing yeah. values in play. Yeah. And it's not that they have a recipe or that they have a, an a priori answer. It's that that body of experience informs their judgment. Yes, yes. And I think that in a curious way is what, I mean, if you were going to be harsh, you would say is missing from the uh, interpretation over time and the development of the Calvin Report. If you were being generous, you would say is sort of embryonic at this stage and can still happen. That's what I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, it, and I think especially if there's a kind of a, we're at a kind of watershed moment with respect to these issues in light of what's been happening in recent weeks. Um, I think one thing that would be interesting, just like our, our exchange of a few minutes ago, talking about particular instances of exceptions or your hypotheticals, um, would be actually to go back and look at the body of experience at the University of Chicago and elsewhere um, they, you know, there've been a number of occasions when students, faculty, some combination have pressed the university to take a, a, an institutional position. There've been a handful of instances when, where they have, there are circumstances elsewhere, you know, in, in other institutions. And I think it just would be very instructive to kind of gather that like, almost like, you know, a case of work. It would be fascinating. Just and, gather, and then and then begin to make some, you know, is there real in Chicago and elsewhere? If you really look at this cumulative body of experience, is there a coherent kind of common law thread that runs right. through it, or is it more transactional and maybe not so satisfying intellectually? And if that's the case, can we almost retro uh, retroactively discern? Um, you know, a more refined set of, of guidelines. That's right. I think it's a fascinating exercise at this point. And, and, and I'll, I'll just also just mention that um, 
in, in this essay of yours, which again, I just think so much of the, un, the unfinished business of the Calvin Report, you describe that you're getting your, your involvement as because you were approached by some students at Chicago who were concerned to see whether, um, I think it was, it was a divestment in Sudan, right? Right. It was, dark, during dark first first, it was a yeah. dark birth situation. Yeah. And, and, and you just describe how you, you saw the students, you charitably, I think, I, I'm going to assume accurately, the students approached you, as I, as I recall, and they asked, could they look at your father's papers in right. the library? Because as I understood it, you said they were like, they were seeking to, to, to meet that burden. They were accepting, okay, there's this burden. And now we're going to see what, whether we can meet it, yeah. which is playing within the rules of Calvin. And yet also uh, thinking, well, let's take the exception seriously and see whether this is such an instance. Right. And they were, I mean, they were so serious and um, really rigorous and rhetorically, you know, very effective. Um, so it was really the students who moved me to go dig into my father's papers again and, you know, occasion that essay you referred to. And I think, you know, again, I don't know. Uh, you know, I think they got close at the level of the board of trustees. There, were, there was real discussion. Um, I don't know what the right answer was, but it felt like the right process. <laughs> you know, it felt like the right process. <laughs> That's nice. And, uh, something you might also uh, just an, an experience I had recently. You may you may find interesting. You know, I wondered whether Calvin applies equally at every university, or does the context matter? So, in that that clause that I mentioned, they talk about actively defend its its interests and its values. But different universities have different kinds of values. Completely. Uh, a whole variety. Of, I, I was I was giving a talk um, two weeks ago in 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 in, in Madrid. Uh, for a large group of academics, our European HXA members, and I was talking about the Calvin principle and the Calvin report, and I was, you know, just dis- describing it with with considerable enthusiasm. And one of the questions I got from the audience was from a priest yeah. who runs a university in in Rome, and he said, "Well, does this mean that Catholic universities should not speak out on matters of that are essential to the faith? Does Calvin not allow that? Do you have a thought about that?" No, it's interesting. <laughs> I, I think you no. Know, once you when you said it, I was thinking of just the variety of of uh, the plurality of universities, and um, so again, I think every effort should be taken to engage with the principle without rigid application of the principle. You know, and it, um, it just feels to me at this point like. There's an opportunity for within institutions and maybe in a kind of broader discourse like your academy, you know, promotes um, for kind of kind of going back to that point of departure that my dad plotted in the initial utterance and re- renewing the conversation, you know, renewing the conversation um, paying some attention to empirical realities and differences within different ins- institutions and maybe within different departments. I mean, they're, they're, I think that, you know, one of the things that distinguished my father's um, First Amendment um, uh, scholarship was just attention to the particularity of First Amendment issues as opposed to looking for a grand unitary theory. Interesting. That you could bring, you know, and again, a way of being intelligent, a way of exercising judgment, not coming with an a priori template for for how you manage things. Yeah, it's that it's fascinating. I think that feels like an important value here. And and I think the other thing that is important to be mindful of, and I'm, you know, I have I have a small organization and my colleagues are all, you know incomprehensibly younger than I am, um, some of them products of the University of Chicago. And these are some of the most intelligent, morally sensitive young people I know. Lovely. They are almost all, except for their you know, affection for me and regard for me, they are almost all alienated from the First Amendment. They see the First Amendment and by extension, the Calvin Report as tools of the power structure. I was going to ask you about that. That's and right. they have reason to. I mean, I think they have they have reason to in terms of various 
uh, trends in, in society. Um, and I think that is a really critical factor on campuses that should be taken into account. And I think um, that those advocating for institutional neutrality for the Calvin Report, for, for this constellation of values, should also acknowledge some degree of failure right. in, in having students of, of great moral seriousness be as, as reflexively alienated and distrustful of these, what we regard as core values, they regard as tools of power. Right. And obviously they can be tools of power, but they can also, you know, empower the disenfranchised, empower the um, folks at the margins. And so how to kind of address that matters a lot. And again, if there's an opening coming to renew some of these conversations, I think it's important to be mindful that if this is a tradition, you know, and, and the key, you know, I gave you the title of my dad's book, A Worthy Tradition really central, I titled it, but based on language I found in his papers, the really central animating idea in the book is that the First Amendment in American life is really a tradition that transcends um, uh, positive law. You know, that's really been hugely important to, to me in my career. So I don't, you know, I am guided by an understanding of the First Amendment as a practitioner, you know, as a kind of frontline journalist. I don't regard the parameters of the First Amendment as being defined by the latest decision of the Roberts Court. You know, for me, it comes out of this larger body of collective experience. It includes the dissents. It includes the debacles. It includes the shameful, cowardly decisions. Um, you know, all of that informs my my sense of of the first amendment you know and you in your opening description of your academy you know you were talking about the responsibilities of successive generations and i think i think we have to acknowledge some really serious degree of breakdown in the transmission of these values across generations now clearly clearly and it was in the 1960s when Marcuse wrote his essay against toleration, repressive, repressive tolerance, yeah. which is a classic essay saying that these ideals of, of neutrality are masks for power and they reproduce what came before them, which has been a really, just on the intellectual level, a really powerful Challenging. Yeah. brand of thinking that in my, in my own view um, calls on us, those of us who love our universities, to be ready, to stand ready, not just to repeat John Stuart Mill and give them John Stuart Mill's book again and again, not but to... Small. Not you, <laughs> I, I used to, I used to assign it at Brown and they say, well, you know, I, we're kind of tired of hearing John Stuart Mill from you. Can we hear something new? And, um, <laughs> and I, but I, they mean that in a serious, I think, and just the way you said, you know, some people are not serious, but many of the students who would say those things are really, they're wanting to hear why the first amendment matters. They wanted to hear why institutional neutrality might, might matter. Um, there's so much more I want to talk with you about regarding Halvin. Um, there, you, you, I, I've been following it minutely, as you can probably guess. And no, no. Uh, several of the university, a number of universities, in the past week or two, have made statements in favor of the neutrality ideal. Most, most notably, Northwestern, uh, where they took on. I think they explicitly said this is a Calvin-generated um, set of ideas. And then another one striking was at Williams, and the president of Williams, uh, Maud Mandel. She said in her statement to the community that I've made lots of statements on lots of topics. You all know that. But my thinking's evolved, she said. Mm -hmm. And evolution to me suggests a, you know, a, a growth and a progress. Now, evolution could, I'm going to keep on evolving, you know, a month from now and go back to my, <laughs> back to my old way. But evolution suggests something like, you know, I, I did that. Now I'm learning. And another, another striking example that a lot of us are talking about is Stanford where Stanford came out for early for neutrality, but then released a statement condemning the attacks uh, a few days later. And is that a contradiction? I'm not actually sure that it is a contradiction, but it's a lot of people sort of think of it that way. So there's, there's much more to be said about Calvin. It's, um, it's kind of wonderful to see it on, on the agenda the way it is. Um, and you know, I, I, think, I think that the, it, it, it's been exciting for me and sort of fascinating. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure. delighted to be you know, pulled into the conversation. I, I think 
that the challenge now is, and maybe your organization has a, a key role to play in this, is maybe to be somewhat less prescriptive and more um, kind of thinking strategically about what processes would look like within universities to build um, understanding within the community and buy-in within the community to these principles. And, you know, and I think that's the key thing. I don't, given the degree of student alienation, given how reflexive and polarized so much discourse is, you know, uh, for, for other reasons, I think there has to be, maybe the best way to put it is to go back to what I said a moment ago. What if there were a way of inviting people to go back to my father's point of departure? Right. You know, to sort of acknowledge that this has been a, I I don't want to use too strong language, but a, a sharply instructive period of these last this last month um and sometimes messes you know sometimes messes and the collapse of a paradigm is a really creative space yes and i think the question is how to inhabit and activate that space and not just leave the wreckage and people even deeper in their entrenched positions nice that's a process question it's not simply asserting the principle and you'll you'll i think you might be glad to know that there are a number of our our, we have groups of of professors all around the country and some of those groups are actively working on this now often with their administrations thinking well how can we craft a set of principles based on neutrality based on calvin that is nonetheless uh correct for that university and and this time and to provide some spaces for statesmanship while also really trying to be true to that ideal that the university is this sort of daring experiment yeah. of, of allowing diversity of thought and not crowding it out and not, not having those endless statements that assume that everyone thinks the same way. Um, I've spent, we've spent more time on Calvin than I intend so we're going to spend less time on another really important topic that I, I just really want to uh, talk with you about and share with our listeners, just about your experience as a journalist. You know, one of the many lines that I've, that I've, of yours that I've read lately that I've really enjoyed in the last week preparing for this conversation, a, a line you say, I'll quote you. <laughs> I can't remember where I found this. But I, just wrote, I just wrote it down on a piece of paper because I liked it so much. You said, I believe ultimately in defending the First Amendment by practicing it. Yeah. And I, I want to ask you about that. So you, you, you had this experience as, as a young man, um, your, your father tragically dying and picking up his, uh, his manuscript. And a remarkable. I, I read Owen Fiss's review in the in the New York Times describing it as a, an act of heroism of a certain a certain type, a really, a really beautiful, a beautiful um, uh, a pen to you and what you you had done as, as a young man uh, for your father and for the country to do that to to, to, to finish that book. Um, you had a difficult experience with your your wife had an extremely difficult experience that I think. Around that time, sort of turned turned your attention. He, would you share something about that? Would you? Sure, would you... sure. So my wife Patricia Evans, a wonderful documentary photographer, and we collaborate. You know, have collaborated over the years. Um, you know, really soon after the the publication of my father's book, um, was out running on the lakefront in Chicago, training for a marathon in the middle of the afternoon, beautiful September day. And was um, brutally attacked, and um, could easily have been killed. Um, you know, it was a, a sexual assault that she was ultimately able to to escape, but you know, was really um, uh, brutalized in the in the course of it. And um, you know, it happened at a point. You know, we emerged from the book. We had two small children, um, deeply invested in our community on the south side of Chicago. And I have to say in this that um, I was really guided by my wife. Um, And this relates to our point of departure in talking about Underhill, Vermont. You know, um, certainly her family and friends in in Vermont, you know, saying, well, 
why don't you just move back when you know, move away from this, uh, you know, the, right. this kind of harm and this kind of threat. And, you know, as I say, we were, we were mature. We weren't kids when this happened. And her sense was that the real injury and, you know, she, as I say, is documentary photographer, traveled all over the world, you know, has been in, we, we've been in the middle of essentially race riots together reporting on them. You know, she's done incredibly sort of courageous work as a photographer, as a been traveling alone in the world. And her sense was that she had, by way of something done to her physically, to her body, she had been robbed of her ability to be in the world and move through the world. It was the, it was the theft of her freedom in the world that was the injury. And we talked, you know, a great deal about it. And ultimately it wasn't my idea. Actually, it was a, it was an editor in New York who, who knew us during those years, who actually, who had been the editor of my father's book. Um, who watching us go through this process over a couple of years at suggested, well, why don't you, why don't you consider writing a book about it? And, and so I, you know, the book really is grows out. I mean, I'm the author and it's, it's my voice, but it grows out of ongoing conversations over a period of years with my wife. So the, the book remind is, me, titled, remind me of the name of the book. The book is titled working with available light. That's right you know, which has multiple levels of meaning and it's the kind of photography she is, but also is meant to acknowledge my, at best, partial knowledge of her experience. Right. Uh, the person closest in the world to her, but still yes, you know, not to presume more than partial knowledge. And, but in the context of, of, you know, working on the book, a major theme for us became where did this happen? I mean, we knew the precise place on the lakefront where it happened, but what, what world did this happen in? And, you know, the book explores that, but it also was, um, you know, sort of propulsive for the kind of work we both do. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I didn't mention this before, but both of us, you know, led very adventurous lives before we met. And then, you know, I've mountaineered all over the world. I rode beyond, a motor beyond, Mount, beyond Mount Mansfield. Beyond Mount Mansfield. Or well, well, 4,000 4, 4, feet of it. But yeah. <laughs> no, I've, I've climbed everywhere, you know, and I, I, a friend and I drove a motorcycle from Paris to New Delhi when we were in, in college, lived in the foothills of the Himalayas for a year and a half. My wife similarly traveled, you know, all over, often alone. and. What what happened is that that energy. Once I was released from my father's book, and you know, with our our focus and sense of occasion, I think sharpened by the violence that entered our lives. I undertook, and and Patsy, you know, very energetically joined me in bringing that same kind of energy to exploring my native place. And my native place isn't Underhill. It's the south side of Chicago. And, you know... Is that, as, when, you, is that when you founded the Invisible Institute? No, the, you know, it, I, what happened is over a period of years, I was involved in various initiatives around the south side. And I became increasingly involved in high-rise public housing in Chicago. So in those years, uh, we're talking the 90s, Chicago, you know, close to where we live, had the biggest concentration of public housing and the biggest concentration of poverty in the country, a kind of Soweto-like city within the city that was visible everywhere in these high rises, but nobody ever went there. And there was all sorts of folklore about these places. And, you know, I became more and more involved in that world, first as an organizer, you know, developing employment programs, working with the resident leadership. And and then reporting out of that environment. And so, you know, that really was that experience over more than a decade 
until the buildings all were demolished and the, the um, residents forced to relocate is kind of the 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 foundation of the reporting I've done I've done since and we in about 2000 we began to report from high rise public housing and that was a period when you know you could publish online and get into anybody's email box so there was you know it, there weren't the spam filters and all the things and so we were doing reporting my wife's a great photographer we had a good graphic person you know i'm a mature reporter so we were doing reporting from a vacant unit in a public housing high rise with wow. the with the drug dealing marketplace right outside the door if you come to visit me there you you wow. know somebody dealing drugs you said where's jamie and he would be he would direct you to me right. um and so we started publishing something called the view from the ground the idea being that you know that we're sort of recruiting reality on behalf of the, the residents, attacking the disconnect between public discourse and observable reality. Fascinating. When we started publishing, I, as a kind of a, you, you'll forgive me, but a mild sneer towards academia and, <laughs> and <laughs> policy, <laughs> policy types, I said that this insurgent thing was being published under the auspices of the Invisible Institute. It was a wisecrack. And the name just sort of followed us around. Nice. And ultimately, many years, <laughs> later, many years later, in 2014, um, we won a big lawsuit in which I was the plaintiff that resulted in... This is um, Calvin versus City of Chicago. Yeah, which resulted in, in um, a ruling, which has been very impactful, that police disciplinary records are public information in Illinois. So citizen complaints against the police and the investigations that are undertaken belong to the public in Illinois, which is, right. you know, and there are very few jurisdictions with that level of, of transparency. Once we had broken down official secrecy and had access to this body of information, we actually, you know, it, 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 it's against my nature. I really prefer the kind of loose, open conspiracy way of operating we needed to create a real organization to be worthy of that moment and the name was inevitably the invisible institute <laughs> lovely it's lovely yeah. um yeah i read about that case long before i know i'd be having this conversation with you yeah. so it was, it was kind of fun to come around and, and to hear about that um i want to close with something um and i'd, I'd love to talk with you for hours and maybe we'll meet in underhill and have a cup of tea and i'd love to do that Let's that'd be that. really fun <laughs> But I, but I want to close with something else that I, of yours that I read. Um, it's an op-ed. I haven't seen the title on it now. It's about libraries. I'm sorry. It's, it's about it's about bookstores. And it's this lovely piece you wrote. I can't. I don't see the title here. Um, it was published in the Chicago Tribune, December twenty seventh, twenty twenty two. And it's an account of what bookstores are like. And you may remember some of the things you say. You talk about how you just you capture the 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 um the civic importance of a bookstore in a way that I found really striking. You say that you wander among the uh, among wander amidst the endless possibilities of the books, shelves containing books written just for you, books that are portals to take you into a deeper world, books with the power to change your life, books that, as you say, deepen the quality of your attention. And then you say this, and as a heterodox note that I was just struck by. So I'll read the whole paragraph. Okay. Again, you know, you're describing, you're describing the experience of the waning, perhaps, experience of walking around a bookstore and spending time there among among the books. And you say, I'll, I'll quote you: "There were no guardrails in a good bookstore, no trigger warnings. Just as there are titles within reach that would enrich your life." There are others that would appall you. A bookstore is, in that sense, a violent place. To conceive of the books on its shelves as engaged in civilized conversation with another, with one another, is half truth, half delusion. War, war, not conversation, is the mode of interaction between many books. Yet the place that houses these contending visions and impassioned quarrels represents the possibilities of understanding and conciliation. And then you close by saying, 
It encompasses our divisions and holds the promise that we may yet recover the democratic knack for arguing constructively with one another, close quote. Do you want to say anything more about that? Yeah, it actually, I'm, I'm so appreciate you, you know, excavating that. It, um, I think it relates deeply to what we're talking about with respect to what universities are. And, um, you know, there, there's language. I think when I said no guardrails, I was um, uh, implicitly referencing Hannah Arendt, who says somewhere, who has a, a, one of her titles is Without Bannisters. Yeah. You know, the idea being that thinking is actually dangerous. Yeah. Thinking is a dangerous activity. If we're seriously engaging with serious questions that bear on the human condition and the human prospect, this is, you know, this is dangerous stuff. And, um, and universities at their best are uniquely places dedicated to that um, essential and dangerous practice, you know, of thinking and of the sort of discourse with one another that enlarges our thinking. Nice. You know, nice. It's in debate with one another that we enlarge our thinking. And, and I think, you know, I, I, I really do appreciate you landing on that passage. You know, what's always struck me is the, um, the husbandry and management and stewardship of the sort of underlying energies that can issue as violence, you know, and the, the discipline and the care and the mutuality of real argument and real engagement is, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the binding of the atom, you know, the, the atom becomes unbound and this immense destructive force is, is released. And I think we're actually experiencing some implosion of that nature right now on campuses where people are, you know, where discourse, vigorous argument is being replaced by lobbying, coercion, threatens, threats of violence. That's right. Fear of violence. That's right. You know, and I think there's, there's, I was grappling, I was groping for it in that passage. There's some way of sort of dignifying the the academic enterprise in recognizing that we're working with radioactive materials, so to speak. Right. You know, working with things that people kill each other over. That's right. And the 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 discipline and the the covenant with one another is to do that in such a way that we aren't engulfed by violence. And right now, you know, we're um, getting some sense of what that looks like. That's right. And I'll, I'll, I, I just need to add that your metaphor of the atomic uh, dangers, it's energy. It's energy, right. It could be used to build. Completely. Uh-huh. Um, let me just let me just thank you for um, for this conversation, for taking time to uh, to come on on the show to talk with, with me and my listeners about this. Um, you know, we're 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 thinking about the Calvin Report a lot, and I'm minded, reminded again of the expression you did from the the bookstore piece about the idea about deepening the quality of one's intent, uh, the deepening the quality of one's attention. And I hope that this conversation with you will have the same effect on my, on our listeners as it's having, having on me, which I think is helping deepen the quality of my attention on the Calvin Report, not just to see it as an inherited doctrine that some people at Chicago wrote back in the glory days, but rather to see it as a report that uh, invites us to deepen the quality of our attention to what it might mean to make space on a university while being a leader, but also making space for, for multiple voices, even when that when the when the stakes are high and the feelings are, are radioactive. So um Jamie Calvin, thank you so much. Oh, it's uh, been it's, a pleasure. It's, it's it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. 
Thank you for watching this episode of Heterodox Out Loud. Our aim, as always, is to give you an insider's view into the perils and possibilities of opening Korean in higher education. If you like this episode, don't be shy. Hit like below and subscribe. You will help us to reach more people. Also, consider subscribing to the Heterodox Out Loud on Apple Podcast or any other preferred platform. If you work in higher ed as a professor, resident administrator, please visit the HSA website and join the thousands of people from all around the world who are working to support open inquiry. Until next time, I'm John Tomasi, reminding you, great minds do not always think alike.